hello and welcome to the skating lesson. I'm Dave Lees and I'm thrilled to have four-time world champion, three-time world professional champion, Kurt Browning on the show. Kurt, welcome to the I like the picture in the background. It's very appropriate. Nice to digitally meet you, Dave. Nice yes, to nice to meet you. And, um, yeah, this is, this is, I thought, a nice little background. Um, back in the days when we actually did figures in mm -hmm. figure skating, um, those were my figure boots. So uh, we called them figure boots because they had figure blades on them. Okay. And they were, the boots were a little bit softer. So back when we did figures, it was very subtle um, to be on the right edge and very slow and intricate for each turn. And, um, and of course, a long time ago, figure skating was all about the figures. 80% of the mark or something was figures until slowly over time they've disappeared. So those are, there's actually no bottom toe pick, and I competed with those for almost my whole career. So like Same pair of boots your whole career? Yeah, because they didn't wear out, right? Okay, interesting. Now, were you good at the figures? Eventually. Um, yeah. My coach, Michael Uranic, uh, was good at his figures, and he loved them. And of course, um, if you haven't noticed already, I'm quite hyper. So the figures were hard to concentrate. I had a question about that. Actually, uh, pain, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I was wondering well, well, if figures hyper? were hard when you were young to keep you, you know, to keep you focused on doing that, you know. They yeah. were. But um, they're kind of like scales for a, a pianist, I, I think. And um, so much core strength and so much like uh, knowing where your body is over the blade and uh, a focus, yes, and focus. But um, he tripled how much figures I did in the last two or three years for practice. And I was on the ice for uh, three hours a day, just almost three hours a day, just doing figures. So yeah. I have a question. It's We're jumping out of order. I had this all planned, but you... That's screwing up your plan right No, away. it's okay. I'd be interested, though, because it's... Uh... Has that helped you maintain your body? Because obviously you're able to skate at such a high level. You know, your basic skating fundamentals, your technique. Do you think that the figures helped you learn how to skate properly and avoid injuries that allow you to perform? I heard you did a double axle and a triple sow cow the other day. So, uh, yeah. Well, okay. Um, figures, I, the right answer would be yes. Mm -hmm. The real answer, I don't know what the real answer is. I, I mean, certainly I think figures gave you a lot of things, but... Um, but I don't know if it was if, if longevity mm -hmm. was one of them. But uh, certainly, I, if I do figures now, I notice even if I'm skating and doing shows and in good shape, and then I do 20 minutes of figures, the, it's it's a very different kind of uh, actual workout, mm -hmm. um, fear, but also in your body. So I'm sure that there was a lot of core and and just toning and little muscles correction, correction, correction for 45 minutes straight. Um, yeah, I think that, I think it was more physical than people thought. Now, how much are you skating these days? Um, so after Stars and Ice, which would have been 2017 in like eight May, I kind of didn't, I haven't been skating. Okay. So that's a long time. I haven't, I haven't been training. And just the other day, um, I got some new skates from Rydell Plug and um, they, uh, they're a lot of fun. They're, so I got up on the ice and I thought, you know, I feel pretty good. So my sister was there. So I felt like showing off for my sister who was visiting and um, did a bunch of double axles and even triple sow and thought, yay. And then two days later, uh, I got hit really hard in hockey. I play hockey on Monday nights and it's been 16 days of just, uh, physio all day. I've got nerve damage down my side. I've got a, a show coming up that I don't believe I'm, I'll be able to jump in. Okay. And it was a really bad, bad collision. Okay. So, but I'm trying to get back into skating. I don't know that I want to chase the shows but i missed i missed it and so uh, get back physical and and, and skating and, and i think the better skater you are the better choreographer you are the better motivator you are so um maybe my my reasons for staying on the ice are different but i want to get back on the ice so i know that you commentate but you've also been working with nam Nguyen a bit so yeah. talk about that you know are you advising choreography coaching what is the status I'm not sure. I think I just, I'm like a grandparent. I come in and rile him up and then leave. Um, uh, his coach, uh, his latest coach, because he's had quite a few, uh, Rob Burke and I go way back. We're, we're very close friends on and off the ice. Uh, we actually played hockey together, <laughs> ironically. And so he called. I don't usually work with amateurs. I don't choreograph amateur programs. I think that it's a, a real craft that needs to be respected. I could come in and choreograph, but I wouldn't be giving the skater all the research and everything that Laurie Nichols and Jeff Buttle, uh, David Wilson, those guys bring to the table. So, but I like the word consulting. So, um, 
Tracy Robertson and uh, Rob Burke and, and Nam himself have done the, the hard work of lifting the choreography, like the heavy lifting in the choreography. And I, I come in and I'm, I kind of am the paint job. I'm a little bit like the paint job on the car. And uh, that, and just the nuances of his acting, I think he's, he's skating the La La Land and I, and I, I believe that the program can get very uh, flat mm -hmm. if you don't come off as a human being. If you come off as a skater, it's just skating to music. But if you can humanize the skater and make people believe in you as a person, um, then you've got something. So that's what we read, the, the subtle stuff that he and I have been working on, little acting, little nuances, um, that's kind of mostly what I've been doing. And I'm um, working as much from here, down, like between the ears as I have between the skates. That's so interesting because his other program is to a crooner, right? And I'm forgetting what the other music is. But when I first saw it, I noticed he was acting. Like, I noticed he was acting more on the ice and before I even knew that you were working with him. So that is interesting. Uh, really? Oh, great. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So how did you get into skating? I know you're from Canada. Everyone plays hockey. Everyone is skating on the pond. We don't have those in New Jersey, like to skate outside. So <laughs> how did you, you know, decide you wanted to be a competitive skater? Uh, well, that decision happened really slowly. I never made that decision. It was made for me. And it just like, just, it, would, it was fun. So when you're having fun and being successful, you keep doing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, as far as skating, the first rink I ever had, Dad put down two pieces of plywood and sprayed it with the hose. Okay. And then um, I played the hockey with my dog, who kept stealing the puck, so I met, spent most of the time. So real humble beginnings, and um, I remember meeting Michael Slipchuk and, and thinking skating people were cool, and the more people I met, the more people I, I liked the sport. Uh, eventually finding out that I loved the performance aspect of it as much as I loved the physical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But probably I became a skater because of the jumping. I mean, the idea of, of flying to the air and being able to land, it's a, it's a thrilling sensation to get Skype down here, up right through here. Okay. Uh, and, and I still, even at 50, whatever million years age I am, I, uh, I still love that feeling. Now, did you so, always like competition? Because when you're successful, you keep doing it. Right? Yeah. And then competition was fun. Yeah. Because Doug Haw has said that you can pull stuff out of your wherever, like no one else. He said that Kurt, yep. he said that you could uh, be missing every test session, show up to the competition and nail it. You just have that innate, you know, I guess, belief that you can do it. And I think when I was young, I was the kind of skater who saw the potential of a competition, not the potential danger of falling and embarrassing yourself and losing, I kept seeing winning and I kept seeing um, attention, positive attention and, and chances to feel great. I just, I just saw it as this positive place. So if you were going to skate well anywhere, then do it at the competition. It made sense. And I was the kind of skater who didn't need 10 or 15 clean long programs for four worlds. Mm -hmm. I just really needed one. Okay. And that's a ridiculous soundbite nowadays when skaters are so organized and such they're so fit mm -hmm. and um, the programs are harder you know that you just don't have any athlete who would ever say anything like that but I have won worlds probably multiple times where I really only had one good clean long program run through <laughs> going into battle okay. um, but I, I knew I could do it that day that said uh, if you really are bored and want to sit through my whole per my, my competitive career, I wasn't consistent. I, I did make mistakes, um, and you know I was never like Orser or Boitano. Those guys were very clean skaters. I was not that guy. Um, but I think that that character, that 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 flawed character, is actually what people liked about me. Hmm. Uh, now, were you but, someone who progressed quickly? Because I, on the broadcast, I said you were 22 when you won worlds. Nowadays, that would be considered, I guess, you know, I guess that's a couple years after probably Yuzu, you know, one. Patrick. Yeah, Patrick. Um, but you had the figures that kind of slowed kids down. Because nowadays you see that there are the girls from Russia doing quads at 13, 14 years old. So I guess did the figures slow down progression and make people well-rounded or how? We didn't give as much attention to free skate, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like I, I told you, my last year I was three hours a day doing figures. Mm -hmm. 
And that also, you know, people have to remember that they have to clean the ice too. We have to do what as Canadians call flood the ice. And, um, and that, that takes up an hour and a half to get, or, or 45 minutes, three, three floods, 15 minutes. That adds to your day too. So we did not give as much priority. Plus, when you're looking around you left and right, uh, Tuller Cranston was my, one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. And then along came Brian Orser, and he's doing triple axel. Well, uh, okay, that changed everything. Mm -hmm. So then all of a sudden, that was an option to you. And then I started watching, going to competitions and seeing triple flip, triple toe and thinking, how the do you do a triple toe after a triple flip? I can't do the triple flip. How do you do it? So I, I think your world just gets wider and wider. Your expectations of yourself get bigger. And, and, and so when I did the quad, it's because of Brian Boitano, mm -hmm. really. Joseph Sabobchek, like those guys motivated me to do it. And then one generation gives to the next. So what do we, like now we're really high when Nathan Penn does what he did. Um, when you're 11 years old and want to figure skate, quad is not an option. Mm -hmm. That's where you're going to end up. And so when you open up the barrier of thinking that it's possible, instead of thinking, well, I can't do triple axel, and then you see somebody do it right beside you and you go, huh, I guess it is possible. <laughs> so that's the, this, this generation is just building on one, what the generation before did it. How long did you train the quad before you put it in at Worlds? Like, were you training it for years and years, or was it something? Well, um, I came home from Europe. I had seen Brian Botano do it, and I secretly started practicing it. Like, literally to the point a couple of times, bye, everybody, goodbye, get in your car, wait till they leave the parking lot of the Royal Glenora Club in Edmonton, and then get back out of my car and go back in, put my skates back on, and try some quads mm -hmm. so that nobody knew what I was doing because I didn't want to be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Or I didn't want people saying, I don't know why I thought this, but I didn't want people saying, who do you think you can you know, try four revolutions? Or, I don't know. I just wanted to keep it quiet. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a couple of people who had seen me do it, but mm -hmm. my coach wasn't one of them. So one day in my practice, I just showed Michael Uranic, said, I have something new to show you. Mm -hmm. And I skated on the ice and did a nice two-foot landing on a, on a quad. And he, he just went like this. And he said, I think we're going to take less time with the triple axel and just start working on this. And that's all he said. That was it. <laughs> I think that was a good... So what was your dynamic like with Michael Uranic? I mean, you, I read in your bio you met him at 13. So what... I, yeah, what kind of, I guess, what kind of a dynamic was he as a teacher? You know, what kind of a coach? Yeah. I had many different great coaches, but some of them were just at like the spring camp and some, you know, my hometown or, or someone at the small rink. Uh, but I didn't really – Michael Urenic was my first real coach that kind of became my consistent coach because I moved to Edmonton to work with him. Okay. I met him at a seminar, and he was just one of the people on the ice. He just got on the ice, and sometimes somebody would call you over. You know, Jan Allmark would call you over um, or, or whatever. And whenever he, whenever I worked with him, he was just chill. He was calm. And he just, I just barely slowed down, and he said something quick, and I got to go again. I barely slowed down. He's, it wasn't talk, 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 and I liked that. And I just he just kept me moving. It kept me going. Mm -hmm. um, little did I know that I was attracted to a guy who didn't really jump. He was an ice dancer. Okay. And uh, I don't know that he. I'm not. I'm not sure. I might be wrong, but I don't. I'm not sure he really did triples mm -hmm. even. And then here he was guiding me through the quads. So, but that was the same with everybody. Nobody had a coach that had done a quad back then. Mm -hmm. Now you see Ermanoff at the boards coaching. Well, he's done quads. Mm -hmm. um, now this generation is taught by people who know what it's like to do it. So Michael was he Michael was less of a tactician or a technical guy, and more he played the skater. Okay. So he worked this more than he worked this. You know, he said things, he did things, but he just really knew how to get the most out of me. For example, uh, I'm doing the quad and practice and popping it. Mm -hmm. So I'm doubling it, doubling it. And I remember this distinctly. He would go, uh, Susan or, or Jesse or Jennifer, can you come over, please? Um, Kurt, you know, Jennifer. And I go, yes, I do. And she's like this little tiny girl. Says, Jennifer, can you show Mr. Browning your double toe? So she would skate off and she would come back and maybe miss it. And if she missed it, that meant try again, Jennifer. And I'm paying for this lesson. I have to watch Jennifer. You know, and then she lands her double toe and says, thank you. And it's, so I have anything to say. I said, thank you very much, Jennifer. That was great. Thank you. And then she skates away. And then he just turns to me and says, see, little girls do double jumps. No, I always say, no, little girls do small jumps. Big girls do big jumps. And then, and then off he went. Going full well by, you know, by, you know, making me feel like an idiot. Mm -hmm. 
he would motivate me. Okay. Uh, and he started popping my jumps, he would call one of his little students over and make him watch her double jump. Okay. And it kind of probably changes your focus too. So a little bit breaks. Yeah. That, that lighthearted approach to life is one of my strengths, I mm -hmm. think, as a performer. And, and it helps me uh, as a father. It helps, mm -hmm. helps me. It's how I get through life. Mm -hmm. So I would appreciate that. Um, my personality appreciated that that scenario played out. So you, your first world was in 87 in Cincinnati. Right? Yes. So you're there. Obviously, Brian Orser is there as, you know, the king of Canada against yeah. Brian Boitano. And yeah, so you, were, you, were you intimidated at that point going there or did you have that belief? Like, yeah. you're not intimidated when you have no expectations. OK. On your um, I was landing the quad at that event in practice. And um, I was I remember being angry that nobody was noticing that I did the quad. So I was doing three or four of them in a row until finally people started clapping. <laughs> And I remember Michael, you're running. I said, why is no one clapping when I do the quad? And he goes, why would they? Who are you? You've done nothing. <laughs> I just did two quads. He goes, so what else have you done? So he was, he always like made me, uh, made me work for it. And, uh, and watching Brian and Brian compete against each other in person was, it was tangibly exciting. Like, I don't think maybe Elvis and I at Canadians one year got to that sort of state of frenzy or but there was something about those two mammoth personalities and talents going head to head that uh, i think was extraordinarily and i was lucky to be a part of that what were their personalities like i guess backstage i mean brian boitano is very cerebral it seems you know when he's competing and yeah. but orser too back then super focused and everything he had a plan for everything and uh, he knew exactly how much of his run through he was going to do in practice. Like he, everything was was uh, monetized. Everything was organized. And I think Orso, uh, Boitano was sort of similar. And, and Boitano didn't miss. He never made mistakes, uh, ever. Uh, that just that just wasn't an option. And so they were they were really intimidating guys. But I wasn't competing against uh, them. I was just there for the show. Um, my proudest one of my proudest moments was standing on the stage in Budapest. Having having just won the bronze medal, and they used to get these small medals. I still mm -hmm. do actually. Yeah. And um, so I got third in the overall free skate. And so it was Orser, then Boitano, then me. And uh, by that, so I I've shared not the podium, but the stage. <laughs> you got the small medal with them, yeah. With them, and that's that was a pretty big thing. So the and Olympics was, in Calgary, how transformative was that for you? That experience. It's a good party. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know that that set me on my path as much as one month later in the, the mm -hmm. world. Because I, I think that uh, I made the Olympic team and went, and I loved the jacket, and I had so much fun. I met, I met the uh, Jamaican bobsled team and Eddie the Eagle and, and the opening ceremonies where, where Orsa carried the flag. And I think that it was a spectacle, and I skated well. I had so much fun. Mm -hmm. I, and, and, uh, and as far as being uh, a future fighting guy for a medal anywhere at the world level. Uh, I don't I don't know that, that that just was this great experience. But when I went to Worlds with the goal of landing the quad and and just just barely kind of did it, I think that changed the way I was thinking. I'm like, I can make a difference. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can work hard and I can get in there and get in the fight and make a difference. Now, now, obviously everyone was thinking that Victor Petrenko would be the next guy to kind of dominate skating. Did you decide then that you could do it? Because, I mean, you were an eighth. You're kind of in that spot where you could move forward. You could. But it wasn't the eighth. It really wasn't. Yeah. It, it yeah. was the eighth was a nice surprise. Mm -hmm. We were hoping maybe for top ten, but eighth was great. Mm -hmm. But it was the sixth at Worlds. Okay. Um, that, and, it was, and it was the doing better in figures, actually, at the Worlds than they had at the Olympics. And doing, doing the quad at the World Championships and, and being able to hold your own on the practices. It was, it was really, it was really that competition that made me go, you know what? And then I went home and I thought I have beat Victor. I have beat, uh, Oh my gosh, don't lose his name. Um, uh, come on. The Russian, the other Fideev. Russian. Fideev, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I'll uh, Fideev and, and then Christopher Bowman and, um, you know, Gregor Spilipowski. And I was like, I beat them all at least once. Mm -hmm. So why not beat them all at the same time? And this was the simplistic thinking that I think helped me, like, be a good competitor. I didn't get cluttered up. I was like, is there someone to show off for? Is there a prize? Yeah, I can do this. 
That was kind of it. So you talked about Orser having like a plan of his run through. Would you kind of go by how you were feeling that day at events? I mean, did it, how did you, what was your plan, Kurt, you know, for the practices? Let's. Yeah, what was my plan? I think that's the question. Okay. Um, I, I think that Michael knew how to play me, but I don't think I knew what the plan was. Uh, and, it, and it actually, not to get modeling, but it actually was my downfall eventually. This, this a little too relaxed, um, and it got me in the warm-up for Albertville in the short program at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And I decided with the few dwindling seconds left in the warm-up that I would do a double flip to make sure my takeoff was right. But I never practiced double flip. Like, who practices double flip at that level? Nobody, or I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did it, but my body tried to do three, and my mind was asking for two, and I got caught in between and got my feet caught, and I took a really bad fall, actually knocking the wind out of me. And my coach, Louis Stong, at the time kind of just froze and stared at me, and I tried to laugh it off. And I got up and did another double flip, landing it, but barely. Please get off the ice. And that was the last thing on my mind. So when I went to do the triple flip in the short, I was cautious, and I put my right hand down and lost my edge and fell. And the rest is history. I, I didn't recover from that mistake. And it was, um, it was probably 90% of just shouldn't be doing a double flip on the warm-up of the Olympics. Mm. And, uh, and that's, so yeah, it was what, what it gave my, my instincts as a competitor or, mm -hmm. or, or as a performer, um, being able to find humor, being able to get the audience in and enjoy the situation to share what you're doing with like all that stuff came from that personality as well mm -hmm. so, am i angry i don't know like but definitely my personality got in the way that day mm -hmm. and maybe maybe cost me the olympic gold medal yeah so um, <laughs> yeah they say that your strength is also your weakness so that yeah that is true yeah you're right yeah <laughs> whoever they are yeah uh now the next year after landing the quad you definitely were very successful internationally. You won Skate Canada. This is you, your bio says you medaled at NHK. And uh, yeah, that was yeah, barely. Officially, you medaled. That's all you. It wasn't had... terrible competition. It was the next year was a terrible. Competition. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then you, how was it a big adjustment being like the man in Canada? Now you know everyone is looking at you. Was that? No, it was after winning worlds that I really went through what you're talking about and. I started uh, being way too self-aware and I started thinking that because I watched Brian Orser, he never made any mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I thought world champions don't make mistakes. Well, that, that's not me. I, I'm, a, I'm a very loose cannon skater guy who does trip and fall because he's pointing and waving at somebody that he's never done a program before and stuff like that. And um, so I, I really got super self-aware when I became a world champion and I actually What's it called? Paralysis by analysis. Okay. Um, I thought my natural timing was off. That that gregarious, outgoing character that I enjoyed being was kind of being suppressed, and I was being careful and cautious, and none of that worked. And I was injured. I was injured a lot. I was injured a lot. So when you went for the first world title, I guess at what point did you feel you had it? You could do it. You know, against Petrenko. Yeah. Oh, like like after Skate Canada. Like okay. on the plane in Canada, I was going, I'm going to be a world champion. And um, naive a little bit, but when I came fifth in, uh, fifth in figures mm -hmm. that year in 1989, I, I, I was like, I can win this. Mm -hmm. I, I, my coach told me, if you can be fifth in figures, then you can move up to first. And it's exactly what he, I, think, like, I just won the short and I won the long. And it was really, really Did you fun. feel like Victor knew it too? I mean, was his coach, you know, like, you know, do you, I don't know if you get that vibe, you know, sometimes in the back, yeah. Pretty hard to get a vibe from those guys. They were, okay. they were pretty. Uh, like Victor is a great guy, and um, I consider him a friend. He's one of the, he's one of my the people that I respect the most in this sport, um, as a human being and as a skater, and actually Galena, Galena too, the coach. Um, I, I think it was the next year I had. I mentioned that NHK did not go well. I fell twice on the short, and once I smacked my head in the ice so hard on one of the falls. And um, I was sitting by myself. I, I tell this story when I give speeches. And I saw Victor and Galena get up. And it was, I don't know why, but I was sitting at, the, at a practice rink after the competition. It was an afternoon event. 
Sometimes facts don't line up in your memory. But anyways, Victor and Galena got up to leave, and they were walking across the other side of the rink, but they went right by the exit, and they kept going. And they went down the end, and now they're on my side of the rink where nobody's sitting. And it became very obvious very quickly that I was the destination. I'm not really friends with Victor at that time. I'm not unfriendly, but I'm not friends. And her, I mean, she's just wearing all fur and all serious and big and important. And they came and they sat on either side of me. And Galena basically said, and I will not, um, you know, do the accent. But anyway, she said, uh, why, are you not, uh, why are you not skate well? Yeah. And I said, not skate well? You said, I don't know. And she goes, but why do you do that? And I go, you didn't see? I, I don't know. I fell. No, so she goes, why are you upset? I said, you didn't, I fell twice. That's why I'm upset. Meanwhile, I'm still trying to figure out why these people are even talking to me. It's very, mm. I'm, I'm their big competition. And she said, when you're you, you're good. When you're not you, you're not good. So just be you, and then you'll be good. And Victor kind of smiled, and they got up and they left. Best advice I ever had. Just mm. be, like, don't be what you think other people want from you. Mm -hmm. Be the best of yourself and be what you want from yourself. So to, to me, to have them come over and honestly just go, dude, just be yourself and come back to competition and let's play. Mm -hmm. They knew I was messed up and, and it was very, and when my own teammates and my friends and nobody knew what to say to me, Franco and Galena came over and, and made me feel better. Did, did people change how they treated you after you became world champion? Like this, how people react to you? Well, strangers, yeah. yes. But like now I know you. Before I didn't, uh, but okay. not my friends and stuff. It was... Okay. I was I was in a at that time we were all very successful. Christian Maguchi was skating with us back then, and we had the champions from each country were coming to the Glenora Club in Alberta and Canada to skate, and uh, it was a pretty high end place. So I didn't I didn't I didn't feel a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, I know that being a world title holder changes your life forever, though. Uh, mm -hmm. I will give you that, and I I like to when I see new world champions I like to welcome them into the family. I remember welcoming in Todd Eldridge when he won, and um, and knowing full well that you're a world you're a world champion forever, and that doesn't go away. Like, yes, Mr. President, you know, you're just always kind of the president. <laughs> and uh, and when you win worlds, you're you're, you're you know you're part of that fraternity. And uh, you know, when I see Midori Ito, to me, she's always a world champion. Like, mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. Now, you mentioned training with Christy Yamaguchi. Now, she's someone who I think gives 100% at everything. You watch her in Dancing with the Stars, and she had that thing won the first week, and every week it seemed like she treated it like it was the Olympics. So what is it like to watch her train? What is going on there? Yeah, It was demoralizing, completely. Okay. Uh, all of us would hate the, the fact that Saturday morning she would, well, not like, like I showed up Saturday at all, um, but Saturday morning she would be there at 8 o'clock in the morning, clean long, um, the long looked the same at eight in the morning as it did at four in the afternoon. You, uh, she was just so able to see success each time the music started, and she wasn't intimidated by four and a half minutes or four minutes or whatever it was. Uh, whereas the rest of us were, we're like, well, huh? I've got eight jumps, and how am I going to get through this? And I wonder which one I'm going to miss today. And you let those little thoughts get into your head. I don't think she had any of those. Mm -hmm. And super humble, um, very very humble. And, but, uh, but, a, but a demon, like a monster on me, like real strong, real strong. Okay. Now, you mentioned Galena talking to you. So when you had gotten to the worlds, had that flipped your mindset? Like, were you then, because you really rose to the occasion, you know, in Halifax, so. Not really. I feel like Halifax, if you go back and watch yeah. the tape, not sure I ever should. Um, it wasn't a great event from the men. I think that... that it was kind of like I won, but nobody really won. It was like who survived. It wasn't so the great. documentary on you points it like so much better that I rewatched. Okay. You know, yeah, the um, the yeah. documentary on me. Um, the one the from '92. Really exciting. Like the short program in Halifax was mm -hmm. for me one of the most exciting moments of my competitive career, bar none, mm -hmm. um, because I popped. Back then we could do two triple axles, one in combination, um, then the second triple axle out of footwork. And then the sec third jump was a double axle. So basically, warm up was about a minute and a half. You just warmed up your axle. And uh, I popped, I did the combination, and then I popped the triple axle out of footwork into a double. So, what people didn't know, or, or people who have heard me speak, I practiced with Michael Uranic, my coach, and I said, I want to do the triple axle in the last five seconds. Like, because back then it wasn't 
Triple Axel's worth eight points. Mm -hmm. it, it just it was more like who was better today, Kurt or Victor? Mm -hmm. And so if I could do the Triple Axel in the last five seconds, well then I'm going to win. Mm -hmm. That's my thinking. So I practiced for about a week with the Triple Axel at the end, never landing it once. Mm -hmm. Just too tired, or it just it just didn't work. So we were like, well, okay, that was a nice effort, but let's switch it. So when I was at the Worlds and I popped it, then I'm thinking, do I do a triple toe at the end? And then I might not be in the top two, which you kind of had to be back then to, to fight for the gold. Or do I go for it and do the triple axel that I've never landed before, even though I practiced it for a week? And so I went for the triple axel and landed it. And so for me, that was, even now I've, like, I've got chills not knowing how I did that. The long was messy and trippy. I had a very sore toe that I could barely get into my skate. Mm -hmm. To the point where I, I'm not sure that I was even going to be able to make put much of a fight, but it kind of went numb, and, and I went for it. And I don't think Victor had a great day. I, I just think that as a group we weren't on, mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm the guy that sort of survived it. It, it. But I might be remembering it wrong, but that's how I remember it. Mm -hmm. Now the next year you pulled out three triple triples, and the, <laughs> the commentators were saying they didn't know what you were even going to attempt. So you talked about how you would change things up. So. Uh, yeah, how, I mean, had you just trained them all to put them in the program? I mean, what was your everyday training like as a compared to? One day, Michael, I'm not sure I'm supposed to tell the story, but anyways, Michael Uranic um, said to me one day in practice, I don't know what the timeline was, but late in the season, he said, well, uh, I know now for sure that Victor's going to win Worlds this year, so you're kind of fighting for second. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean you know that? And he said, well, you've already won two, and... You know, he's skated much better than you this whole season, and my back injury was bothering me. And he says, yeah, it's kind of his turn. I said, well, what do you mean it's not, no, it doesn't work that way? We have to get on the ice and see who wins. He goes, yeah, but it looks like he's going to win. So I don't know if he'd heard something. Like, definitely all the judges are watching competitions during the season. and It's definitely victors this year. So he was playing the, the man. Mm -hmm. So he challenged me. So I remember where I was standing, and I looked at him, and I said, well, let's just do a program he can't beat, you know, because if the judges need to be swayed, then we need to hit him with a bat. Mm -hmm. He goes, well, what do you want to do? And I said, we'll just do all triple-triple combos. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, then start working on that. And that was one of the programs that I really had only done clean once. And I popped the quad, unfortunately. It would have been really nice to have done that, uh, popped it into a triple. But it was triple axle, triple toe, triple south, triple loop, and triple flip, triple toe, triple axle, double loop. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was only one triple axel that was by itself, like one jump in the whole program that was by itself, if I remember properly. And it worked. Um, it kind of was just too much, and they kind of had to give the title to me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was fun. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm the only person to do three triple triples because then they changed the rules. <laughs> so were you someone who, did you study your competitors the way, you know, Megan Duhamel studies her competitors? Would you watch Victor at Europeans or something like that? No, never. Okay. I I didn't have a clue. I mean, I remember doing figures thinking there's some guy near the Black Sea doing his rocker right now, and I hope mine's better. Um, but to see their programs ahead of time and make a game plan, I mean, he said it had to be really good, so I said, let's do three triple triples. And, and I know nobody can beat that, not right now in the world. So no, it wasn't, it, it was more like, it was more like in the moment, like mm -hmm. finishing your program and stepping back on the boards and watching your competitor and looking at your coach going, I guess I better do two quads today. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like that. Now, would you were you someone that trained the full program? Because Victor would sometimes die out at the end of his programs. So yeah, I was gifted from my father. I think of, of just having really good endurance. Um, with all the testing that Skate Canada did, uh, we we called it the Canadian Figure Skating Association back then. Uh, I always I always had crazy high scores. Um, so I was gifted. Physically, just by Mother Nature, God, my dad, you know, but my dad was a, an amazing athlete, like uh, climbing mountains and doing things until he was a uh, senior citizen. Mm -hmm. So uh, I feel that that uh, I did train the program. I often did both, like long back to back. Okay. So just put it on, rewind the cassette, <laughs> put it again, and you had as long as it took to rewind the cassette and that little lead in time when you push play to to start the program again that was the uh that was the break okay so going into 
the Olympics, being three time world champion, did that get in your head at all? I mean, obviously you had an injury, your back injury you've discussed. Like, uh, no, it was just I was just so injured. Mm -hmm. um, six weeks before the Olympics, I had a I had a truck that, that was a, a manual, so you have to push down the clutch, mm -hmm. change the gear, and bring the clutch back out. But I, I six weeks before the Olympics, for the opening ceremonies, I could not push the clutch down. Mm -hmm. So I was literally driving not to skating but just to physio and just my I was sleeping on the hardwood floor. Mm -hmm. It was I was screwed up, mm -hmm. and uh, I was pushing the clutch down with my right foot and driving with my left. So I was driving like this, mm -hmm. and that, not safe. So uh, no, it was not. It was a physical battle. It wasn't a mental battle, mm -hmm. and instead of not even going, mm -hmm. knowing. And then and then you'd kind of get to the rink and you would do a triple axel, and you thought, well, maybe I'll just pull it off again. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have the wherewithal here to to believe that I would land it. Mm -hmm. The short program, triple axel was beautiful. I should have landed it, yeah, but I fell because I, I didn't believe. Mm -hmm. Now, did you, how much training did you realistically have to be prepared, you know, going into those? The documentary shows you, you know, them working on your back and everything like that, so I mean, yeah. A documentary. I don't even. <laughs> it was uh, Life on the Edge from you. I found it, and I don't. I kind of remember something like that. Um, it, it wasn't. It wasn't enough. Okay. For example, I skated much better at the Worlds, which were only weeks later. Mm -hmm. like, literally, my mom keeps saying, if the Olympics would have been just two months later, in the grand scheme of things, I, I might have. I might have. Who knows what would have happened. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was able to, my coach sent me home. I didn't stay long after the Olympics and sent me home for physio and training and, and, um, and I had a much better world. Mm -hmm. Except for a double a short that half the judges didn't see, but. So I guess after that season, you, it doesn't list any, you know, did you compete the next fall? I guess what kind of was going on in your life? Yeah. I did because I didn't want people to remember me like that. Mm -hmm. um, you hear skaters say things like that. And I'm, I'm back just to end my career so that I feel, and you, you kind of go, it's been a long career. You've been a world champion twice. Why, like, why do that to yourself if you're, if you're really hurt? You know, but it's important. I think it's important to step away from competing mm -hmm. with that sense that you left it the way. Kind of like when you, you leave for a trip. Some people like to have the house clean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, there's something about that, and I think I wanted that. And when I competed uh, Casablanca in 93, I felt adult, I felt grown up and mature. Mm -hmm. um, and Sandra Bezik had given me a program. Louis Stong's wife, Mary Jane, had found Casablanca music. The whole thing, I felt like I needed to honor it with a win. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, I retired. I retired that night. Mm -hmm. I, I did not, I, I knew that Alba Stoico was going to carry the flag for Canada. I guess not literally, but figuratively. Mm -hmm. And and I, I, I wasn't leaving Canada in a lurch because all this was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I quit. I quit that night. And um, my agent eventually talked me into going to the next Olympics. And I think that, I think I went to those last Olympics kind of wondering what was going to happen instead of let's make this happen. Well, that, that Olympics didn't really work out either. Did you buy into those Olympics? Like, did you get like tunnel vision at any point? Or because you talk about how you had decided to quit. So, you know, yeah. when you. Yeah. Sometimes I think I create memories to mm -hmm. justify what happened. Okay. I gave a I gave a speech a couple years ago, and it was the first time I had seen two or three big programs in my life for research. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about um, the way you feel about yourself, the image that you create for yourself, and, and having to deal with how you think other people think of you. It's all about perspective. Mm -hmm. That was the speech. So I needed to watch that short program and, and the short program from both the Olympics and the long program um, in Albertville. And, and it was really hard to watch. Hmm. It was so much closer to skating well, like big jumps. Mm -hmm. why, why didn't I land it? And I think that I had created a protective coating over the years of, with memories. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, well, I go to the Olympics but I remember that I was not real. I'd already retired, so maybe I just didn't go with focus. Well, come on, let's let's be realistic. I'm pretty sure that it was the Olympic Games. So I, I was pretty focused. Mm -hmm. But we build uh, a, like a coating over top of things to protect yourself. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes, and I, watching those were really hard. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and they weren't they weren't as good as I remember. Like my skating wasn't as good as I thought it should have been. Hmm. I was more than I thought I should have been. The jumps were better than I thought. So why did I fall? And I came out of it, and I was I was actually having tears. And it was like for days and days I was kind of back into that feeling. Hmm. And it was good for me as a commentator to remember that these people are so vulnerable. They're so vulnerable, and they look superhuman. And there's somebody you've only met twice, and you know, they skated good last week. Why aren't they skating, you know, well again? Mm-hmm. And then I, I was like, yeah, this was good for me. This was good for me as a as an older version of myself to go back and to remember um, how hard it is, mm-hmm. how special it is, and uh, and and that maybe I should be a little bit kinder. Mm-hmm. Did you feel good going into those Olympics ahead of time? I mean, Elvis had won the Canadians that year. Did you feel? Yeah, he did. I I. No, I didn't feel as, Mm -hmm. I didn't know where my place was. Okay. And I think that sometimes I was talking to Nam and I said, you know, you, you want, you have to know where you want to park your car. I, you know, you have to, you have to see your spot and then put your car into it. Like it's a bad analogy, but I mean, you really have to know where you think you fit in to the, to the, that final fight standing there before they get on the ice and everyone's shuffling around. And if you're shuffling around going, I don't really know what's going to happen here. Mm-hmm. Well, you do, you know, and like you know, people like Jeff Bottle and Patrick Chan and and um, you know Elvis, all Canadians. Sorry, <laughs> but um, like certain skaters, they know what they want to do today, and they mm-hmm. get out of my way or whatever it takes. I think at those Olympics, I didn't know what my role was. Hmm. Am I here to win it? Is Brian Botano here to win it? Am I here to be lucky if I get a medal? I, I don't think I knew my role, mm-hmm. and. Uh, being somewhat arrogant, uh, I, I think I did better when my arrogance told me what I could do and then I went for it. Mm-hmm. My confidence was with my arrogance and they went together and I'm going to give this audience a show, I'm going to give the judges something they can work with, you know what, I'm going to win. And I usually won on those days. Did you feel like the sport was changing? Because obviously all the professionals were coming back. Then yeah. there, you know, and CBS, you know, in the US it was presented like you against Boitano and... Uh... Petrenko were competing, and then it wound up being the young guys who did well. Um, but did it feel like a fluctuation of the time, or was it? I felt like I mean I'd competed. I'd never competed amateur wise against Brian Botano, but I I just felt like if you're going to win, you're going to win no matter who's there. Mm-hmm. So having Victor and Petren- uh sorry Victor and Brian come back sort mm-hmm. of uh, didn't bother me mm-hmm. actually. I welcomed them. I thought this is exciting. It's good for the sport. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I just firmly believe that if I if I deserve to win, I'm I'm, I'm going to beat those guys anyway. And if one of them deserves to win, then they're going to beat me. Mm-hmm. And I was pretty okay with that. But I'll tell you a little story. The next day after the short program, uh, Brian Botano, Victor Petrenko, and Kurt Browning are in the second last flight. All three of us. So we get on the ice to practice, and we're kind of like. earlier in the day than we're used to, don't you think? You know, like we, we just, we, we kind of were the, so I went over to Linda Lever, Brian's coach, and, and kind of asked permission to do something, and she said yes, and I, I went over to Victor and talked to Brian. So what we did, they all agreed, and what we did before we even started practicing, we went to center ice, and all three of us bowed. <laughs> I don't know if there's any footage of that, but we did. And you know what, it, it broke, it broke the tension. Mm-hmm. Um, they were like, yeah. We know. We know. Here we are. We got it. All right. Good. Okay, now we'll get the business and, and have a good practice and see what mm-hmm. we can do in the world. But um, both, both guys agreed. And we went mm-hmm. to center and bowed before the practice even started. And to yeah. kind of acknowledge the tension in the room, you guys should be in the next. We, we, you know, we were embarrassed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so we wore it. We're like We took it. And then it allowed us to concentrate and get our job done. Now, did you feel like a... I guess from 92, like a holdover because you didn't win the Olympics. Did you feel like, not a trauma, but like a, did it bother you, I guess? Because when Michelle Kwan went back for Salt Lake, it seemed like she was tight. She fired her coach that year. Like, it seemed like there was a lot going on upstairs. You know, did you feel that at all? No, it's a different situation because of the story I told you about, Mm -hmm. like, literally retiring from competition Mm -hmm. the night of the long program in Prague after I got my world title back. So How long were you retired for? Like, really? 
Well, I mean, you're skating because there's shows and stars and ice, and it's like not like I left the ice. Okay. Uh, but it, it, some at some point that summer, my agent he told me he says every time you see an Olympic symbol, you're going to wonder what could have happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I went, oh, shoot, I wouldn't like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was healthier, mm-hmm. and so I said, okay, I'll, let's go compete and see what happens. But I think it was that last part of the phrase that was the the bad part. So no, I don't think what happened to Michelle happened to me. Okay. I think that. Uh, I think I just didn't have the fight I usually have. Mm-hmm. Like, no, you know, I don't, I don't really know. Yeah. Uh, no, you had one of the best longs at the event in Lillehammer. Like, you know, it was not this... was third long, I think. Yeah. D- was it an enjoyable long? Like, when you look at your career? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I think uh, I promised Scott Hamilton, who was commentating up to the left up there, right over there, mm-hmm. Um, that I would dedicate the last jump in my program to him. Mm-hmm. And, and so I did double axle, half loop, triple toe, double axle, hop, 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 triple toe or something like that. And I landed the triple toe and then spun up and pointed right up at him. And if you listen to his commentary, he goes, kuh, kuh, kuh. you know, he kind of <laughs> can't believe he did that. And then, and then I stumbled through my last spin because I was laughing that I had done that. So that's, that's the kind of person that, um, maybe stumbles at some point in his career because he isn't that super hyper-focused. But I would never trade that mm-hmm. for fun moments that came from telling Scott Hamilton I'm going to dedicate the last jump of my long program to him and then remembering it and then pointing at him. I mean, that stuff, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Mm-hmm. So you turned professional right when skating was obviously huge, you know, in, in North America. and But you, the first year... It, in the competitions, at least, you didn't perform as well as you would later on. Was it – what was going on there? Was it your injury? Did the homework. Holy cow. Well, Dude. I remember this because, I, you know, I used to have the VHS tapes, and they would talk about you like you were like, I don't know, like he needed a therapist. Like he's not skating the Rocketeer well. What's happening? You know, like this is – Oh, Rocketeer. Oh, my gosh. Well, okay. <laughs> so, the short stories. Um, and Scott Hamilton helped me a little bit because mm-hmm. I came into those events – Again, remember I said you need to know where you fit into the picture, mm-hmm. even if you're wrong. Mm-hmm. If you're wrong, that's not great, but at least you're, you're, you are calm here. Mm-hmm. You know. And I went into those professional competitions. I'm against, I'm against Brian Orser and Brian Botano and Victor Petrenko, but I'm also against Todd Eldridge mm-hmm. and Yevgeny Plushenko. And like, it was like the real deal. Paul mm-hmm. Wiley, Christopher Bowman, like we were, we were like, you didn't get on the ice and win because you showed up. Mm-hmm. You had to bring it at those events, even if it was rock and roll competition against the girls, you know, mm-hmm. Wits and Karen Kadavy and Liz Manley. And you, you still had to bring it. Mm-hmm. And there was live television. It was massive pressure, mm-hmm. big paydays, but massive pressure. And at the beginning, I thought I'm competing, but I'm doing a show, but I'm competing. And I did neither well. I didn't do the show part right, and I didn't do the competition part right. And Scott Hamilton said, you just have to learn that it's both now. And so when you're competing, you can kind of rely on your music and your character. But let's face it, it competition isn't – very few skaters break out and really entertain. Um, Keegan Messing is doing it now, for example, but not too many skaters really break out. I mean, Shoma Uno is all – ooh, is all artsy and stuff. Yeah. Yes, but – no, but that's his concentration place. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and so I didn't know how to do both. And so Scott kind of said a couple things that, that and it took me, you're right, it took me a couple years. And as far as Rocketeer, uh, that was a beautiful program. And we wanted to have like a kind of Brian Boitano esque program done by Sandra Bezik where uh, I showcased my skating skills, my musicality. It wasn't like the clown, it wasn't silly. It was, it was like, look at how good a skater I actually am. Mm-hmm. And then my costume arrived late. It arrived in a box at the venue, and I and I remember I put it on, and it was like, it was like this thin. And you looked like a speed skater level of like t- you could have done the luge in that costume, Kurt. Like that was so thin. The material was so thin that I felt naked. You could see my chest hair coming. It was terrible. It was I was so intimidated. Um, I actually like went out of my way to try to cover things like I did I was so uncomfortable in that costume that it I, I, I did was I was embarrassed I, I didn't know I was I couldn't skate mm-hmm. did not like 
So then, so you became my mother's all-time favorite skater the next year because you did Brick House, and she will still discuss this. Um, now, that was, yeah, that was big. Did you decide my... to go all out? Like, I'm going to do the biggest show slash competitive program because I mean that uh, was it, a splash. You know, I didn't make that decision. I think that decision was made by Michael Siebert at Stars on Ice. Michael Siebert, uh, ice dancer mm -hmm. um, with Bloomberg, and uh, he was. Uh, a staple of Stars and Ice creativity and Sandra Bezik and him were like this amazing team. And I believe Michael Siebert brought the music to me. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were in Lake Placid, I believe, and we we're sitting in the stands and he took me away from everybody. He wanted to have a very serious conversation. I'm going to present a piece of music and, and you're not going to like it, um, but I want you to keep an open mind. So you've probably never heard this before. So we, of course the Brick House comes on. I was like, Brick House, perfect, cool. I love that. That'd be fun. Let's do that. And he was like, you know this piece of music? I'm like, are you kidding me? So, yeah. So we did Brick House, and then Jeff Billings, the um, choreo uh, costume designer, created that look that also matched Christy Amaguchi's look when she did, um, was it, I think she did. Oh, so that. quiet, the Bjork, it's yeah. Quiet. I think she did that, and so I skated, then she skated, then we did a little group number. We all had that blue, shiny, with the white look. Were those pleather pants? Was that, what would you just, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and so Michael Siebert found the music, and Sandra and Michael and me, everywhere, and Jeff Billings with the costume, and I think that it was just, everything came together. It was the right skater with the right music, the right idea, the right costume, and, mm -hmm. and uh, it just connected with people, and I had so much fun skating it, like so much fun. Even to the point where 20 years later I would do it and I'm still having so much fun skating. The, might as well, since we're telling such tales. The pleather pants, mm -hmm. that are more famous than me, um, they, between my legs, like mm -hmm. up thighs, they would, as I'm doing crossover, they would catch. The polyethyl cloth of whatever rubber they were made of. Would, and so I'm doing crossovers and it was like, eek, eek. And I would try to do moves, and it was like throwing my balance off. I'm like, my legs are sticking together. So out comes the Vaseline, and I put the Vaseline between my legs, and I'm like, okay, that's much better. That's good. So then that night for the show, a little bit of Vaseline between the legs and go do Brick House. Mm -hmm. And then after about three or four cities, I started realizing, I go, actually, I don't need the Vaseline anymore. Whatever sticky, tacky aspect of the pants was there is now gone. Fast forward many, many, many years, um, and somebody says, we'd like you to do Brick House. You go downstairs, and you go like this, and you pull out the Brick House pants, and you look, and where the Vaseline had been on the pants over two decades, it just, they were gone. It was just like, I skated in front of three or four million people live for Battle of the Blades back when we did that thing on CBC with the mm -hmm. hockey club, and it was live, and I did Brick House as an older version of myself, hoping that these blue pants were going to get one more skate out of them. <laughs> between the legs and they sort of made it it could so have been the first viral moment of skating you know i mean you know yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the story behind those crazy pants but jeff dillings michael siebert sandra mm -hmm. bezik it was a great team and and that program helped secure me as a viable source of entertainment professionally and mm -hmm. and it really gave me confidence and kind of springboarded my career a little bit i think so I wanted to ask you, because you skated that program, you won the World Professional Championships, which I think used to be on the same weekend as the Super Bowl. And I remember it was like a huge, big deal. To... It was a big deal. 16,000 people live. Yeah. It was, it was nuts. And Brian Boitano took this event very seriously, and they would always have this really dramatic music, and Brian looked like he was going to the Olympics. What was. was that showdown like at the World Pro? And everyone was in black tie. It was this very prissy event. I mean, they, it was... Special. You it know. was a long event too. You skated, and then it was like the men competed after midnight, okay. often, and it was a long event. And sixteen thousand eight hundred people stayed all night, and it was a it was a long event, um, with the very best. Like everyone was a legend, mm -hmm. you know, and and it was so highly respected. It was an amazing event, and we were all more nervous, as nervous for that as worlds, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, the respect for the title was that high. Now, technically, we didn't, we weren't doing what we did at Worlds, um, mm -hmm. but but the respect for each other and the events and the fans, it was it was a massive thing. So when I won, um, I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. 
and I didn't think that I was going to win placement because Brian skated well, but mm -hmm. the judge gave it to me. Um, and it was because of Brickhouse, because the, the second program was not the technical skater, it was more artistic. Mm -hmm. And I think that I, I just, it was so big, the music was so big and the choreography was so big. The energy was so big of that program that, that that's why I beat Brian. Mm -hmm. And I was watching the screen backstage and someone looks at me and goes, I think you won it. And I went, what? Because we were looking at the marks. And then someone came around the corner and went for Ken Wu, the cameraman, comes around the corner and goes, and I was like, oh my God. And I got a hug. And then when I turned around, I was like, I won. And who came around the corner from the Kiss and Cry right then, Brian Botana. So I was like, I won. And I'm now 18 feet from Brian, who just lost for the first time in six years. Mm -hmm. Something went, ah. And I go, what do I do? What do I do? So I went, Brian, I won. And I went running and I jumped into. <laughs> and so I was like, all in. And he just grabbed me and he hugged me and said, congratulations. And it kind of, once again, broke that tension. It was like, what did we awkwardly pretend that I didn't just scream, I won? So, um, but Brian's that kind of guy. Brian's mm -hmm. a, one of the better people in the world, I think. And, uh, and I don't know him well, but I, I, every time I interact with him, I think he's wonderful. And so that's mm -hmm. a big testament to the kind of person he was. That was like a huge loss for him. And when I was celebrating, he came around the corner, I, I thought, just, just run with it. So I ran and jumped into his arms. And, and uh, he was gracious, and we had a good laugh about it. What was it like being rivals with him in the professional world? Because you are more happy-go-lucky, and he seems very serious about competition. He was always getting to opera, and you were in the pleather yeah. pants. You know, like yeah. He's a goof. He's a goof. Mm -hmm. He's a funny guy. He's a goofy, funny guy. So we actually, we actually are on par. I just carry it over the boards more than he does. Mm -hmm. I would on the ice. Um, but yeah, we're he's he's, 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 he's on the ice with all business. But he he's the kind of guy that loves practice. Mm -hmm. Like he just, he craves the work and he craves the, the sweat and the power and, and all that stuff. And so I, I really, uh, I really hope for him that he's, that his body's doing well so that you know, at, at this point he can still get on the ice and test himself. I think he's, he's a bit of a beast that way. He posts videos of himself doing figures. So you'll have to do the same, you know? Yeah. Cause you both seem competitive. So maybe, you know, you could do your rocker, he could do his and we could. Well, I was going to compete in the first year they were doing figures again. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had a whole bunch of personal stuff going on in my life and, and a lot of changes and I could not, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I basically just called them up and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm taking that off my plate right now. But I was, I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, so I was practicing my figures and, and with those skates on and I have to tell you, I was, I was I was terrible. I, couldn't, I was like, were they really ever that good? Because I, I don't even know how I could do it. So a lot of respect for what we did back then. Hey, who's the only person who ever win worlds with figures and without them? You, you know? Yes. Kind of, uh, you know, that's that's not a goal that you try to win or achieve. But it was, it's just kind of a fluke. So it's kind of cool. Two with and two without. Well, I want to ask about you and your Lutz jump, because the commentators <laughs> used to make a thing that you couldn't do Lutzes, but when, right. and you're so traumatized by Albertville, but you did two Lutzes in that program when I went to watch it, and I was like, wait, I thought he couldn't do that, and you did two of them. I did not explain that, because they're right. And uh, they were good. They were like good Lutzes, like they would have gotten at least a plus two, you know, like they... I have no, no idea why. You know how many times over a beer with friends that know uh, we've laughed about that. Like, I landed two jumps in my long, and there were the two jumps that I. Why were they even in my program? I don't know. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. I know that that I should, but I don't. Mm -hmm. But I, like, I remember that night thinking, looking at my coach, going, why "Did I miss a loop, or why did I miss an axle when I don't miss those? I mean, why did I not miss the LUTs? Maybe I just had no expectations of the LUTs. Mm -hmm. Like, just just skate into it and just see what happens. Oh, I landed. And the other ones, expectations really can get in the way because you, you don't act naturally. But honestly, I'm just a little embarrassed to say I don't, I don't even know. I don't have the answer for that. What bothers you about the LUTs? Like, what don't you like about it? The, the short story is that so you're back outside edge on my mm -hmm. left foot because that's the way I rotate. Mm -hmm. And the LUTs and the flip are essentially harder than the toe because your body is closed to the direction that you want to spin. Mm -hmm. so standing on the left side of my body, and I'm kind of open this way, but I want to rotate that way. Mm -hmm. Whereas a toe, I'm standing on the right side, and look, I'm already open, so it's a shortcut. Mm -hmm. So that's why everyone starts with quad toe. 
But with Lutz, my right hip is so flared open that when I went to put in my toe, it wasn't straight up and down. It was open, making me even more open to this way, but I've got to turn that way. So the greater counter rotation. Okay, yeah. That's for disaster. Plus, I used to kick. I used to, because of that terrible takeoff, I used to, I'm looking down because you can't mm-hmm. see my, I used to slide the left foot, the heel back into the right, mm-hmm. and I would go right through the leather and into my foot and off to the hospital again. So I had... Mm-hmm. Three different times going to the hospital with the blade through the boot into my foot. Okay. So Lutz and I, Lutz and I had a terrible relationship. Oh, terrible, terrible. Did you always do it in the corner? Because sometimes now, like when you watch Gracie Gold and she would do her Lutz, she would go right down the center of the ice and do it, and no Lutz corner. So would you? Are you a corner person? Always in the corner, but as a pro, I kind of figured out this shock ta entrance, and I could fake it, and it would be on the outside edge, and I would do it, and that was down the middle. But it was so ugly. I mean, nobody wanted to see it. It was just an ugly, it was an aberration of a lot, so it was terrible. So also, you're known for having very quick feet. Now, did you take tap or anything, like as a kid, or is this just an annoying natural talent that you have for everyone else? You know? I hated, uh, imitated Scott Hamilton. I okay. went to Scott Nice to see him skate in Buffalo with my agent, mm-hmm. who was kind of courting me to join Stars and Ice, like the IMG world, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I saw Scott Hamilton do a, a country western number with a red shirt on. And he did a, a good old-fashioned serpentine step. And uh, his footwork just brought the music to life and his feet. And he was so fun. His, the, the choices of steps that he chose were creative and fun. Like a, like a guitarist just like going, ding, 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 like just, he was amazing. So I, I, I was so entertained and uh, motivated by that that I, I think I started making footwork more of a priority and then I'm like hey I'm, I'm, I can do it too mm-hmm. so now could you do that would you like doing the IJS footwork I mean you probably have to do it when you choreograph for people so I know I don't that's my point no okay no. um I've I choreographed steps for mm-hmm. amateurs but that, I haven't done it for years mm-hmm. and um no because I didn't I didn't like being I don't think I would have enjoyed liking. Well, you don't know the difference, right? Because these mm-hmm. young kids have grown up in the system, so they don't know the difference. But I, I think that if you watch my footwork from from back in the day, it was simple. Mm-hmm. It was, well, compared to the, what I footwork I did as a pro, it was simple. But we didn't. That's what everyone was doing. But you, you guys know, skated fast. Like you skated faster, and you know, footwork yeah. was about showing off your fast feet, mm-hmm. not footwork. Footwork. Foot. Like, whoever would have thought footwork meant bend over and touch your head to your knee? Mm-hmm. Like my, in my day, it was like, shock ta, shock ta, three turn, three turn, spin, shinny, 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 American step, you know, flick, 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 slide, hitch, kick, flick, ta da! That was footwork. Mm-hmm. Exactly like that. <laughs> now, how much do you have to study the rules when you commentate? Like, do you actually look at all the levels? Like, is that. Uh, oh, you know what? I'm I, just a, as I commentate, I, I I keep learning more. Um, mm-hmm. I'm lucky to have a great team around me. Mm-hmm. Um, my job is it's what the trouble is. We call it the toilet bowl. So if we start with a rule, and we've only really got twelve or fifteen seconds, which is a long time to explain something, but not if you start getting into the minutia of the. Well, it's minus five, but actually it's not minus five because it's factored, so it's really only about 3.8 or sometimes 2.5 because it's half of it. Depending, but if it's a quad, it's less, it's more, you have more, more risk, more reward. And the people on the couch go, what did he just say? And so you really have to decide definitively, if I'm going to talk about a rule, it's got to be short, sweet, and help the viewer at home mm-hmm. um, and not get in the way of them enjoying the skating. So it's a, it's a, I feel like it's a bit of a tightrope that you – you can get too far into a, a, the rules, and you can't get out of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so that's that's how I think. So yeah, I know the rules, but I don't even really go out of my way to know them too too much, uh, because in a way, I, I, I still want to commentate the skating. Mm-hmm. Now, do you pr- do you practice commentating like around your house? Do you you know like do you is this a skill like we're? I no, it because it's not real. Okay. No. Yeah, it's just you, you can't you can't do it. You, I watch skating. Like if I have to get back into commentating, and haven't watched skating all summer. I'll start watching skating again, mm-hmm. and start. Yeah, okay, short program. What are their energies? What are they thinking? What are their priorities? And then get you know back into the new rules of the year, which this year there was a lot of changes. Mm-hmm. Some of them quite good, 
And um, and that's how I get back into it. I just sort of go on YouTube and you know watch the skaters and and just start getting back into this place. But you know I love Carol Lane, the choreo- uh, coach that I choreograph. I can do this. The coach that I commentate with, and, um, and of course Andy Petrello, who works for CBC, and she, they, these two people are are great and they're energetic and it's a lot of fun and an honor actually. This is going to sound like I'm vote for me from there but it's a real honor to lay your voice over top of a skater's hard work mm-hmm. and um sometimes like a skater you blow it mm-hmm. you talk too much or you get something wrong or or you or you just you leave the audience with a sensation of what the program was like that maybe <laughs> only you agree with mm-hmm. when you talk to other people they, they talk to me about it like that and i go you know now that you say it i guess you're right I, it wasn't like that mm-hmm. but you do the best you can, and you try to honor each skate. Um, you know what I have to do? You gotta go. I gotta go pick up my son at school. It's well, um, like, I, like I have to leave the house in like yes. 30 seconds. Well, this has been so much fun. Meet you. Yes. And, uh, talk again and text me whenever you have anything or a question about something or, or just to gossip about skating. Yes. Because uh, I think it's a wonderful world. It's given me a place to be physical and mm-hmm. athletic, but also creative mm-hmm. and daring and choosing my music and my own personality and make my statements or make people laugh and it's a wonderful sport and so I um, I try to honor it and give back uh, give back to a sport that gives has given so very much to me I'm, I'm, I'm crazy overloaded with luck to learn Carter figure skating this was so much enjoyable thank you for coming on the skating lesson Kurt skating lesson all right <laughs>